This is a podcast for Functional Ecology, a British Ecological Society publication. Hi everyone, today I'm delighted to welcome Anna Stokel to the podcast. Anna is a group leader at Konstanz University, Germany, and she is fascinated by how sensory systems process information to give animals a gateway to the world around us. At the core of her work is the question of how neurons transport and transform the signals they receive from the eyes into a meaningful output that can guide animal behaviour. At present, Anna has authored over 25 papers, and on top of finding out more about her, we're going to be discussing her recently published article in Functional Ecology, Flower Patterns Improve Foraging Efficiency in Bumblebees by Guiding Approach, Flight and Landing. Hello, Anna. How are you today? Hi there. I'm very well. (laughs) Thank you for having me. No, absolutely. We are delighted to have you on with your perfect functional ecology paper. I was I was fangirling over it before this podcast uh, recording, but it really is the perfect paper to provide evidence of what a functional ecology paper should look like, all the most appropriate types of subjects for functional ecology. But, but before we get into the paper, um, perhaps we can just start with some introductions. You can tell us who you are, where you're from, and how did you come to study bumblebees? Yeah, so actually it's it's been quite a journey <laughs> to the bumblebees and actually also a journey through many different animal model systems. So I'd say my background is very much in biology slash neuroscience. So I studied both of them and I have always been, and we have this beautiful term for it, neuroethology. So I've always been studying questions relating to how do how does neural processing lead to adaptive behavior and very much focused on senses and vision is my absolutely favorite sense. And that has where I've also focused most of my attention, most of my work on. And I've been, as I say, I've been hopping model organisms. I have worked with jellyfish, frogs, electric fish, with mice, and then with different insects. And I've been touring around (laughs) Europe, which I've studied in Germany in Heidelberg in Munich, I then went to Sweden to Lund actually to do a PhD, um, had a short stint in Finland for a postdoc. And then I came back to Germany. And so the um, the paper that we've submitted to functional ecology, um, I actually conducted this work in at Würzburg University. And then I've recently moved as a group leader to Konstanz. So yeah, and um, our main study organisms, and we can talk a little bit more about how this study came to be are actually not bumblebees, but we're working on hawk moths. Um, these very, as I find, <laughs> very uh, charming um, insects that are hovering in front of flowers to suckle nectar. These are main model organisms. And yeah, this study has essentially opened bumblebees as uh, an interesting complementary model organism to us. That's fantastic. Thank you for that. So before we jump in um, to the nitty gritty of the paper, uh, I was wondering if you could tell, are hawk moths your favourite study organism, would you say? <laughs> yes, yes, firmly. I have to say that. No, absolutely. I've been thinking about how to pinpoint it. So I think for once, they're just they're just incredibly charming to watch um, because especially, so we're working on um, diurnal hummingbird hawk moths that you can really also see outside in many places in Europe in summer hovering like little hummingbirds. Um, they're very curious. They're not, even in the lab, they're not, easily um, freaked out by us, so to say. So you can actually observe their behavior very, very nicely. Um, And they're fantastic to also access their neural processing in the brain. They have very fascinating eyes. So kind of on all of the things that I'm interested in, the the eyes, visual inputs, neural processing behavior, they just make a fantastic package. Um, And on top of that, they're incredibly cute. And people, (laughs) they can actually get people over their fear of moths. So I think for that, they're also a fantastic ambassador. (laughs) Amazing. Yeah, ticks all the boxes. So um, I wanted to know, because I always ask people how they came to be an ecologist. (laughs) And it's always like a fascination with nature from, you know, when they were really young and usually loved watching birds and things like that. How did you come to biology and neuroscience as well? Well, actually, the funny thing is my my kind of backstory is very similar to that. So I think when I was a kid, I also had all of the beautiful, um, beautifully illustrated nature books, animal books. And I think I always saw myself as an explorer um, somewhere studying leopards or lions. And then I came to be mainly a lab biologist <laughs> um, who uh, rarely is actually outside. Um, and that really had to do with me having actually since school days a great fascination for vision 
and for understanding how this sense that is also so important to us to really make the world, um, to experience the world around us, how that is actually, um, how this percept is brought about by the activity of neurons in our eyes and in our brain. And it was this mm -hmm. fascination that pretty much guided me through my entire studies to lean more towards first biology and then more towards neuroscience and actually yeah get more into the mechanisms and into the fine scale details of animals rather than watching the whole things um somewhere outside yeah right so so it came from an interest in sort of books and stuff did, did you spend a lot of time outside where did you grow up where, was it somewhere where you could experience all of this yeah, so I, I grew up in the southwest of Germany, um, beautiful Palatinate, it's called. Um, I, I should plug this. Um, <laughs> fantastic wine country, I should mm -hmm. say, for all of those who doubt um, the quality of German wine. Come to Palatinate and check it out um, or drop me an email for recommendations. Um, I have no stakes in Palatinate wine, but I like to say it. <laughs> yeah, so the southwest of Germany. <laughs> um, yeah, funny enough, no, I wasn't a great... I, did, I wasn't a bird watcher or insect watcher or anything. I was really much into books, for sure. Uh, I was very fascinated by exotic animals. Um, and I think it took me a while to appreciate, especially insects. I was really scared of insects as a kid and as an adult. It, it's been a process. Um, <laughs> um, and it really came through the more theoretical fascination with the topic um, and very much the sensory ecology, sensory processing, neuroscience questions mm -hmm that insects make very good models for answering, that I got interested in insects first as a neuroscience biological model and then started to really appreciate insects um, for their amazing behavioral repertoire, for their beauty, I should say, um, for many of them. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm getting better with them. Like <laughs> moths are perfectly fine. Bumblebees are fine. Um, yeah, some other insects, I, I still have a, a healthy respect, I would say. <laughs> well, you have to reveal now which ones, which ones uh, cause most fear. Yeah, that's true. Well, I, I wouldn't say fear, but I'm, I haven't made great friendships with uh, locusts yet, um, cockroaches, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> because they always shared they always shared rooms with um, our animals. So mm -hmm. I had mm -hmm. a lot of exposure, but we're not friends yet. But we respect <laughs> each other, I would say. Colleagues, yeah, yeah, fab. So uh, yeah, let's dive into the paper. So um, just for you know, audiences who might not be aware of all the different terms and the kind of specifics of your you know study subject. Can you, in plain terms, explain what the novelty of your paper is and what it contributes to our understanding of foraging efficiency? Yep. So um, if we start there, so really the, the context of our work is the importance or the, the role that flower patterns play for insect foraging. And in a sense, this is something we, we all experience because we see insects forage also at the flowers that we have on our balconies and gardens. And we are very much attracted to the colors of flowers and the beautiful patterns um, that we see on flowers. And so the, the context of our study is what role these, specifically the patterns that are on flowers have for insect foraging. And there's a, a, a huge um, or very long history uh, to this study that started in the late 18th century where um, um, the first suggestions were made that flower patterns can actually help insects find the nectar on a flower. And that has also led to the term nectar guides being used for flower patterns, all um, with this idea that they might help insects to kind of point out where they find the nectary and also maybe used as kind of walking guides to make their way to the nectary directly. And so in our study, we've actually been looking at exactly this role of flower patterns for um, bumblebee foraging. And I should also say we were by no means the first ones to look at how these flower patterns might improve um, the foraging efficiency. So the time that the bumblebees take um, either from landing on the flower to getting to the nectaries or generally to go from flower to flower emptying nectaries and not just so there have been many studies looking at that in bees um, different species of bees um, in butterflies and in other insects and they all showed that indeed very much as has been hypothesized for a very long time flower patterns improve foraging efficiency what we were specifically interested in though is how so what exactly in this entire process 
from an insect approaching a flower, landing on a flower, making its way generally on foot then to the nectary um, and also to departing the flower again to go to the next one. What in this entire process is actually affected by the patterns and um, improved by the patterns, so to say. Um, this was the focus of our study, and, and we looked at that by um, carefully tracking individual bees um, during this entire process of approaching, landing, um, going to the nectary, and then also leaving again. And what we observed, and what is really central to our study, is that these flower patterns had a role at a much earlier stage than we thought. So they actually guided the animals to approach the flower and guided them to landing positions, very much like you would have markings on a runway for a pilot, helping the bees to mm -hmm. approach um, and also land on the flowers in positions that were indicated or, or highlighted, so to say, by the patterns. And um, what was really surprising to us, though, was that we didn't see any effect of the patterns on um, the actual time that the bees made their way to the nectary. So as they landed and then walked to the nectary, they just walked straight there, whether they walked along a pattern or not. They also didn't use the patterns to kind of indicate where the nectary is and directly land there, but they always landed at the edge of the flower, guided by the patterns, and then they made their way straight to the nectar. So that was really surprising because it um, made a bit of a question mark on this concept of flower patterns actually being used as nectar guides. Um, for us, what we observed was much more that they were acting, if you want, as as flight guides and as landing guides. Um, but I should say, when we put it in context, there are actually um, other studies, um, also in functional ecology, a, a paper by um, Leonard and um, Uyi Pai, Papai, um, in 2011, that also showed that um, naive bees really were much faster finding the nectaries when they had patterns. But bees that had actually experience in foraging and had experience in the artificial patterns that we use in the lab, um, they went to the nectary in the same speed, whether they had patterns or not. And so in our study, it's important to say that we actually tested all of this on bees that had been foraging on patternless gray flowers, but they knew where the nectaries are. They knew how to get to the food. And so in this context, it seems that flower patterns are not needed to guide the bees to the nectary and they don't improve their efficiency to find the nectar. So if you want, they're not used as nectar guides in that sense when the bees are experienced. But even though they're experienced, even though they know how to handle these flowers, the patterns helped them and improved their efficiency of approaching and landing on the flowers and quite substantially. So the improvement in foraging efficiency we saw was about 30% which means like about every third approach to a flower, you're essentially getting a free take if you have patterns compared to if you have none. Wow, that's remarkable. Yeah, amazing. Um, so, I mean, we've covered some of the key takeaways and highlights. Uh, perhaps it would be useful to talk about, as a love letter to your love of hawk moths, uh, the similarities and differences between hawk moths and bees and maybe other animals with regards to, you know, um, mm -hmm. vision and processing information that way um and yeah maybe we could as a as a as a background to the story so how we actually came to look at the bumblebees interacting with these artificial flowers is that um we, in in my group we had been studying um, hawk moths interacting with flowers and flower patterns for a while before that um, and it's it's really quite impressive because hawk moths, they don't land on flowers, so they hover in front of them and they have this incredibly long proboscis that's about as long as the animal. So I always say, imagine that you're trying to get a, a straw that's as long as your entire body into the opening of a, of a drinks can, and then you know how a hawk moth must feel when they're hovering in front of a flower. Um, it's an incredibly complicated um, motor control task to get this proboscis there. And so the hawk moths are using patterns on flowers as well to guide their approach and to guide their proboscis on the flower. And this is what we had actually been studying. And <laughs> to my shame, I should say, um, that paper is still not out. And the bumblebee study kind of overtook these studies um, in the lab. And then we were, and I think this is probably also a topic that comes up more regularly on this podcast too these days, we were hit by COVID. Um, we didn't get access to hawk moths for a while or to our hummingbird hawk moths for a while. And we were thinking about um, what to do also because 
I should, and I will give a big shout out to the students who actually did most of the experimental work in this study. We had students who wanted to work in the lab who had um, thesis projects planned. And that's when, um, when the idea came up, why not try kind of the comparative study of what we're doing with the hawk moths, with bumblebees, which are available and which were available um, in Würzburg at the time. And I should say only available because my colleague Johannes Späte, who is an expert on working um, with bumblebees and bumblebee behavior, um, was happy enough to collaborate on this project and actually lend his expertise so we could set all of this up. And well, to your question, mm -hmm. um, what are the, the similarities to the hawk moths? Um, in, well, first of all, in terms of their visual ecology, um, they're very comparable in that they have similar um, color preferences. So both the bees and the hawk moths, for example, prefer um, blue and yellow colored flowers and also blue, yellow contrasted patterns. So we could just take exactly, mm -hmm. literally exactly the same stimuli. Um, they also have very similar color vision systems, trichromatic color vision, UV, blue and, and green um, um, uh, spectral peaks, uh, sensitivity peaks. Um, so in that sense, they're very nice for comparative studies with the big difference when it comes to flower interactions that mm -hmm. one of them lands on the flowers and one of them hovers in front of the flowers, which means probably for how they're approaching flowers, they're very comparable. And then the hot moths essentially land their proboscis and the bees land their whole body, which of course gives them um, many, many more cues once they landed in a sense, because, or different, uh, maybe not more cues, but a different experience of flowers than the hot moths have. Um, because something that we are completely kind of taking out of our study on purpose, because we were interested in visual cues, is that flowers also have a, a 3D shape. They have mechanosensory cues on, on their surface. They have an odor. Um, and of course, the insects that land on the flowers experience these cues completely different to the hot moths that have this distance to the flower. But in many ways, the approach experience, I think, is very comparable. And also, it's very comparable in terms of what we see in the data, both insects, hot moths and the bumblebees use patterns to align their body as they're approaching and really use them, these cues kind of as runway guidance kind of to come into the airport. And they also use the patterns to land both at the edge. So the bumblebees land at the edges of the flowers and the moths land their proboscis at the edges of the flowers. Very, very comparable. With the big difference that at least in our study, the bumblebees didn't follow the patterns to the nectary. Um, but the moths do with their proboscis. So they very much tap along the patterns as if they were little walking paths, essentially, for their proboscis. Yeah. Fascinating. That's amazing. So um, I'm going to ask you now, and everyone hates it when I do this, um, to get your crystal ball out and mm -hmm. think into the future. So personally and for the wider field or, you know, study subject, where would you like your research to be going towards next, you know, upcoming themes or takes on stuff and what changes do you hope your work will precipitate yeah i yeah i, I really like this question because i think this study is a very good example as i said i come from quite a different background so we're much well we're very much anchored in a quantitative behavioral um, studies we have done quite a lot also more on, on kinematics of flight um very much or, and neural and behavioral flight control and i think this What's really interesting in this study is the findings that we had for the bumblebees that the patterns are very patterns of flowers are really important for them to control their approach flight to control their landing, and that this is a persistent effect for all bumblebees whether they experienced or not. Um, I think it highlights an interesting thing, and that's that what I find very interesting about this is there is a big community um, of neuroscientists of behavioral um, researchers who work on flight control and on landing control in insects. Um, and then there is a, a big community of um, sensory ecologists, of ecologists that work on the importance of um, insect flower interactions, on cues for insects that you find on flowers. But there isn't that much overlap, in my personal opinion, on actually bringing these things together, having very quantitative investigations of how, for example, in this case, the flower patterns um, could actually um, guide a bee's flight and landing. And we have, and 
in a sense, we have all the tools, we have all the theories of, um, or many theories, not all of them, <laughs> there's still a lot of questions, on insect flight control, on insect landing control. And I think this is a really cool place where we could bring these things together, where our very quantitative work that has been done on, also our study, I should say, on very abstract, um, very controlled stimuli, but still stimuli that are not really real flowers, can actually be put in a more natural context. Um, so something that I would really love for this work to continue to in the future is testing what we found on more natural flower patterns and ideally also on real flowers, different types of real flowers, to see how much of this actually um, stands the test of, of a real world scenario, so to say. Um, and on the other hand, learn from this for what we know about insect flight control, insect landing control with real targets. So what from all of our beautiful checkerboard patterns and stripe patterns that we let our bees and hawk moths and flies land um, is actually relevant for an insect that lands on such natural targets. And so I think this is, this is a beautiful example mm -hmm. of where um, the, the neuroscience, neuroethology um, that we've been doing can um, use this context that is very well described that we know a lot about um, in, in ecological terms and really have a better connection, a better crossover in, in our studies for the future. For the more ecological side to learn, um, or for both sides to gain essentially um, insights. And Anna, I was just wondering if you could speak on sort of foraging and bees and the impact of your paper in an ecological, under an ecological umbrella. What, what, what's, the, what's the relevance there? Essentially, what our results show is that we have to have a bit more of a differential look on flower patterns in terms of their ecological importance. So our results, together with previous results from other studies, would suggest that flower patterns are really important as nectar guides, as we often term them, especially for inexperienced bumblebees that haven't foraged on flowers, haven't learned where on a flower do I find the nectar. And for these bees, um, they are really important as nectar guides. But for experienced bumblebees that have foraged on flowers um, and have learned where generally in a flower configuration do I find the nectar, um, flower patterns might not play such a big role as nectar guides. But what I think is really the biggest takeaway in an ecological sense is that they are still very important, even for this experienced bees, to guide their approach flight and their landing. And we have to keep in mind that a bumblebee and a honeybee as well, they can visit hundreds of flowers a day. So experience in our experiments means they have visited a few dozen, which means after a day, uh, a honeybee and a bumblebee counts as experienced in the sense of our experiments. So that means after a day, flower patterns might not be so relevant for them anymore as nectar guides, but they're still relevant to approach flowers and to land on them. And that makes a lot of sense because flight control and landing control are, um, are behaviors that the animals really rely on their sense of vision. Whereas once they land on the flower, they have many other cues to actually find the nectary, the shape of the flower, um, mm. the surface of the flower, the smell, humidity cues. Um, and so in this ecological sense, I think it's really important to put a view on how important um, flower patterns are for this first stage of the interaction, which is the approach and the landing. And that they can really at least, and I think this is the interesting thing for the future, does that translate to real flowers? And does also this 30% improvement in foraging efficiency translate to real flowers? Because that would be quite quite an um, impressive improvement if you think about a bee visiting hundreds of flowers a day and being able to visit a third more if mm -hmm. they can use the patterns versus if they cannot. That's fantastic. Thanks. And I was wondering if you could talk about any kind of like policy people and stuff always talk to us about, oh, you know, how do we synthesize? How do we talk about, you know, what's the applicability of this research to to like conservation or to those types of things? So I was wondering if you have anything to say on that? Yeah, so what I've been thinking about is really, um, again, it translates to what are the features and the patterns on actual flowers? Again, we use very artificial ones in our study that the bees use. And will we get the same improvement um, of foraging efficiency with patterns on, on flowers that the bees experience in nature. 
Um, and if we do, then it becomes interesting also from a con um, conservation point of view, because we humans are very, very uh, good at changing the types of colors and flower patterns that um, insect pollinators experience, because we love ornamental flowers as well and beautiful flowers. And if you actually look around in our gardens, on balconies, in cities, we have a lot of, of flowering plants there, but many of them are not um, the types of plants that a bumblebee would have naturally experienced, um, let's say, in Central Europe um, or in the UK. And so a question that I'm asking myself, and well, I can't give any policy advice here because I don't know the answer to the question. Many people are working on similar questions, um, is what role do these um, ornamental flowers that we have altered to um, fit our own standards of, of beauty, what, how do they affect the insects visiting um, flowers in our specific question how would altered colors altered mm -hmm. patterns on on ornamental flowers impact um, the animals approaching and landing and finding the nectaries um, i have to keep this question open i think it's a really really interesting question um, to look at um, in the immediate upcoming future but yeah i don't know yet <laughs> yeah. fantastic thank you for that um, so i was wondering as well um, just before we sort of start to wrap up whether you have i mean you mentioned that there are shout outs to give so maybe we'll do the shout outs sure yeah um as i i hinted at that so um that the study was actually done by undergrads so um alexander dietz um who did his bachelor thesis on it and robin richter who did his master's thesis on it really carried the the big bulk of the experimental work and not just did the work but also were instrumental in in um really improving the setups, improving our um, experimental designs and making the study what it, what it actually is. Um, many, many thanks to both of them. It was, it was a really fantastic experience um, to work with them. And a great, I think, a great example of, um, of what, you can, what you can do if you're really, really excited about um, working with animals and, and are interested in, in these kind of questions. Huge thanks. I've already mentioned um, Johannes Späte, without whom none of this would be possible, <laughs> because I really had no idea about um, working with bumblebees before we started the study. Um, and he was sweet enough to share his expertise and to really invest in this collaboration and has convinced me that bumblebees are an amazing model organism and that we really want to keep in the future, <laughs> actually. So thank you, Johannes, for essentially starting this whole um, yeah, complementary line of research in, in the lab. Um, should also thank um, James Foster, who's been involved in this and helped us with the number crunching. So he has been very helpful in in setting up statistics um, that allowed us um, to essentially deal with this kind of data while keeping well keeping individual bumblebees um, in mind in the statistics. Perfect. Thank you. And just to wrap up, uh, I always like to ask, um, what would your one single piece of advice be for other early career researchers and people interested in getting into this kind of work uh what would you tell them <laughs> or what would you tell young you what's the advice that you would have loved to have heard uh, it's a it's a very good question i think i honestly think um <laughs> well this is two things <laughs> young me i would have told don't be scared of insects because they're amazing creatures <laughs> and i think as the study shows actually you can you can get a long way with relatively simple methods, I would say, relatively simple means. And there are so many incredibly fascinating questions around insects, especially insect pollinators, where what I love about it is, is and I can only encourage everyone um, to, who's interested in that to do that, you can, you can watch it outside for yourself. And you can come up with, again, these what we did are simple experiments. This is not complicated in terms of equipment and in terms of concepts, essentially. Um, come up with um, with ideas and um, with um, experiments that you can do, for example, in a thesis project like Alex did in his bachelor's thesis and really get into this field if you're interested. Um, mm -hmm. So I think go for it. <laughs> it's the main thing and don't be afraid. Um, also not of creatures with six legs or eight legs because they're amazing. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, I've really enjoyed the chat today and I'm sure our listeners have too. Um, just want to remind all of them that this will also be transcribed and there'll be some 
additional links such as to the paper, to the plain language summary, to Anna's website as well for anyone who wants to get in touch about wine recommendations uh, <laughs> or the study or the study, the study too. Um, and yeah, I'd just like to wrap up by saying thank you to Anna. Um, I've really, really enjoyed this. And um, yeah, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. No problem. Thank you, Anna.